accuracy of our college, uh, Sir uh, Gurudas Mahavidyalaya, Kolkata. I welcome everyone uh, present at this program. Uh, our colleagues from this college, colleagues from other colleges, uh, students from from other institutions, uh, our eminent speaker, most importantly, uh, Dr. Shail Tony Ghosh, Assistant Professor, NIT. Uh, my warmest regards for her and uh, sincerest uh, thanks uh, for taking her, uh, taking time from, I'm sure, a very tight schedule and uh, sharing her, her views with us uh, today. And last but not the least, uh, our uh, dear students of our college. Um, throughout this uh, period of lockdown, is now stretching into its uh, second year. Uh, our college, like so many other institutions of higher education, have been trying out new modalities uh, of academic engagement. And uh, due to the compulsions of the current situation, almost all such engagements are uh, digital by default. Uh, now, uh, you know, the digital mode cannot quite replicate or reproduce the warmth of face-to-face uh, -face interaction in, you know, uh, physical, actual seminars. But uh, this is the best uh, we can do under the given circumstances. So that is that. Uh, I would uh, congratulate uh, the Department of Physics of our college for organizing uh, today's webinar uh, on a topic which I presume is uh, quite relevant for our times and as well as must be very interesting uh, because uh, our experience of the pandemic you know it, it has it has been so overwhelming and it has uh, sort of uh, spilled beyond our own uh, the, the narrow disciplinary uh, domain of each and every discipline and it has actually uh, in sort of uh, invited responses across disciplines and uh, uh, um, uh, encouraged us to engage, engage in cross-disciplinary interactions and exchanges. And uh, today's uh, lecture will be, I think, a very significant step in that regard. So I will once again, I'd like to thank all the participants and again the speaker for their gracious presence. And I hope that uh, this will be an engaging and enriching experience for all of us. Thank you. Uh, I think without uh, much delay, uh, Shomitaji, I think uh, we can now uh, call on the speaker and we can all enjoy the lecture. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Shinjini, for your uh, words. Uh, exactly, the content of the webinar will address uh, will uh, address the study of infectious diseases and its diffusion dynamics with the help of mathematical and computational models. And it will focus on the choice of appropriate model and parameters for understanding the very complex dynamics of such diseases. So, without any delay, I would like to introduce and welcome our respected speaker, Dr. Shantori Ghosh, in this webinar. Again, thanks for accepting our invitation in these hard times, and we are honored to have you with us. Dr. Ghosh is a faculty member of the Department of Physics in National Institute of Technology, Durgapur. Her alma maters include uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University, Bose Institute, and IIT Delhi. Uh, her research interest lies at the boundary of physics, mathematics, and biological systems, where uh, complex natural phenomena can be explored using mathematical models and computational tools. So it is quite interdisciplinary. And her research collaborations with eminent institutes resulted in several publications in journals as well as conferences of national and international reputation. With substantial experience in teaching and research, she is now leading an active interdisciplinary research group 
in complex systems, dynamics, and stat statistical physics. I would request her to uh, share her views on the uh, topic. And again, thanks, Shantori, Dr. Ghosh. Thank you, Shankita. Thanks a lot for uh, the nice introduction. Uh, hello, uh, everyone present here. Uh, I uh, thank uh, the administration as well as uh, the faculty members of uh, Department of Physics of Gurudas College for giving me this opportunity to talk to all these young students present here. Welcome you all, students. So uh, today I will try to share uh, some of the basic stuff and some of the uh, research that we carried out recently in the context of uh, COVID-19 dynamics and uh, trying to understand it, predict it, and uh, most importantly, uh, relating what we learn in a course of physics, how we can apply those knowledges to understand systems which are real and around us. So without much delay, let me just uh, share my screen with you. Uh, please let me know if you can uh, see my screen. Uh, is my screen visible? Mm, I could have presentation to full screen. Yes, yes, visible. Uh, is it now full screen? <laughs> okay. Okay, so um, I uh, urge you all because the topic is quite interdisciplinary and there are students present here, also faculty members from maybe various backgrounds. So if you uh, are uh, uh, struggling to understand any idea, you can interrupt me at any point and ask me questions and I will uh, surely answer, uh, try to answer the questions then and there. And if you have any further questions, detailed questions, you can post that in the chat and I will try to address them after the presentation is over. So let us uh, begin with our discussion of COVID-19 pandemic uh, through the lens of computational physics. Uh, so uh, I, I uh, really do not need to uh, introduce uh, to you uh, a lot about the pandemic that is around us, that is the truth around us nowadays for maybe more than one year. And uh, till now, uh, 220 countries have been affected by this disease, uh, approaching 20 crore infections worldwide. And the death toll is 40 lakhs, uh, around 40 lakhs. So uh, this pandemic uh, is something that uh, we have never witnessed something like this in uh, our lifetime or, or even uh, our parents and our, they also haven't seen something like this. So when something like this happens, the first question that comes into our mind, the some first question that we start asking ourselves, we are still asking ourselves that when is this going to be over? Uh, so uh, when, when we try to understand that, we uh, need to answer questions about prediction, that what is going to happen in future if this is uh, the data we have right now. So based on that, uh, we try to understand that how uh, this uh, dynamic, this very complicated dynamics, and I will come to it, that why it is so com complicated uh, to predict something uh, on this kind of uh, complex dynamics. It, de it depends on various factors. It depends on virus itself, obviously. It also depends on uh, fomites, and uh, fomites means that when uh, someone touches something or someone sneezes or something, and that is also capable of spreading the disease even when the person is not present there airborne uh, disease, uh, it is an airborne disease or not that. Uh, also, uh, the population being affected, the properties of that population, their immunity level, their age, their vulnerability, things like that. Uh, symptoms are one important factor. Testing kits and efficiency of those test testing kits, accuracy of that, that is one factor. Healthcare facility that we can provide to people, uh, the sick people. And also the most important part is that in this entire process that is going on, there are different level of time scales at work. So together, all these things make this dynamics really complicated. And when you try to uh, predict something on that, what you need is a quantitative model. So uh, when I'm talking about quantitative models, I must uh, just mention a little bit about, uh, in general, what, what kind of models I'm talking about. So there is a field which is a very interdisciplinary field where most uh, mostly physicists, they contribute, 
with their mathematical and computational tools and that is at the very boundary of physics mathematics and the real systems that is uh, society or biology or ecology something like that where they apply their tools the very very, very well developed mathematical tools that we have in physics to solve problems to these complex dynamical systems so in the, in these kind of systems what happen is that Uh, there is uh, no certain uh, chain from a reason to a result and that result is reason for something else something like that but there are complicated feedback loops present there and these feedback loops make it very tough to understand that what goes on uh, in a long time limit so uh, basically in this particular kind of approach what we try to do is we try to take a crude look at the whole so we don't ignore we don't just take a small system out of it out of the total system and try to just understand that dynamics but we take the whole picture and i can try to look at a crude uh, crudely to the entire picture so that is what complex dynamical systems mean so uh, these systems are capable of uh, predicting or understanding uh, complicated real life phenomena like climate and weather uh, living cells interaction organ dynamics how, how your heart works how how Uh, um, uh, how complicated organs that we have they are also kind of machines right how they work uh, social systems financial market uh, disease and health and collective decision making like voting things like that so you you uh, can understand these pictures as a whole uh, using these tools and uh, most of the tools that we use basically uh, are borrowed from our knowledge of basic physics so what am i going to talk about today i'll try to talk about three ways to model this pandemic dynamics so that we can understand it so whenever from this point onwards whenever i uh, say model that means simply to mathematically uh, write down some equations or formulate an algorithm so that we can understand and predict the dynamics so that is our model so uh, the first question comes into our mind that why should we write down equations and why where from equations comes in real this is just a virus that is spreading and uh, is there really some equations that we can associate with it so uh, basically the thing is that at ju just uh, at the very beginning that i told it's a crude look, look at the whole so maybe i cannot take into account of all the integrities that is going on but yeah i can take into account of the overall global phenomena and then uh, gradually i can go on adding one by one uh, complex terms in it to make it closer and closer to the reality so the first need of understanding uh, of of a model is to understand the system of transmission uh, of infections in a population and then to help interpret the observed trends that we are seeing so suppose i am seeing a data can i interpret it if i have a model if i have a set of equations maybe i can then to identify key determinants of the epidemic what are the controlling factors of an epidemic what are the parameters very precisely that are associated in spreading of the epidemic then we can predict uh, that how should we go on and collect data so that we can understand the scenario data what would be the best way to collect this data and to forecast future direction of the epidemic and evaluate the potential impact of any intervention so intervention means like lockdown like uh, uh, closing long distance travels closing schools vaccination these are interventions that human we are doing to stop Uh, that spread of disease so what kind of uh, effect can we expect from this uh, interventions that also we can predict uh, and evaluate so you don't have to do the experiment on the crowd itself you can do it on your computer and at least understand that what will happen when you do uh, it uh, in the real life system so the first and foremost tool that we have and that is the most common tool uh, that is being used all around the world from maybe uh, uh, last one year or so people have tried their best to develop these models are based on differential equations so the very basic uh, uh, differential equation that talks about uh, uh, this disease transmission models are quite quite old and uh, the first model that came in the picture was called an sir model and i will talk about it in a few minutes so that sir model was developed to such Uh, successfully predict plague data and that is long back so that was the first uh, in europe there was a plague you know right so that that plague data had been correctly uh, modeled and understood uh, with the help of that model so that was the first uh, interaction of mathematical equations with epidemiology uh, and, a, and a whole new discipline of mathematical epidemiology developed 
from that point, point onwards. So what do we do in this model? I'm talking about differential equations, so let me just quickly tell you that how to write down these differential equations. So what we do here is, we first identify the key variables in this scenario. So what are the key variables in a, in a um, pandemic system? Key variables are people. So we are the ones who are getting infected, right? So how many kinds of people you can imagine? The people who can get sick, who are not sick yet, right? So they are one set or one box of people you can imagine. There is another box who are sick and they can spread the disease and there will be some people who got recovered. So this is the simplest kind of way to write it down. There are other uh, um, ways to write it as well. So we'll talk about it, but in a very simplest crude way, if you want to understand an epidemic like this. So this is the steps. These are the three boxes that we can talk about in a society. People who can get sick, people who are sick and people who have recovered from uh, the disease. So how do you write the differential equation? You assign a variable, one by one, you assign a particular variable to each of these populations. And you study that how this number of people can change with time, okay? And you write down equations like dx dt. So suppose the first population, let me call that x. So suppose the first population of susceptible people or people who can get sick are called x. So how can x change with time? There is only one way it can change with time. And that is, if they get sick, their number would reduce, right? Let us consider a very, very crude system where there is no birth, no death, no people are leaving the population. I'm talking about a closed box, the number is fixed. Then there is only one way the number of susceptible people can reduce. And that is, if they become sick, right? So then, if that is a decreasing term that is going down from the total population, you add a negative, uh, negative term to your uh, equation. So what you do is that you uh, you write down mathematical uh, parameter associated with this transition from susceptible to infected, from people who could get sick to people who got sick. You, you draw an arrow and you write down mathematically that parameter in your model. Similarly, if there is a way that the population can increase, you write down that increasing term. But the increasing term has to be positive and the decreasing term has to be negative. Simple as that. That is how you go on adding positive and negative terms in your differential equation. And finally, you solve it. Once you write down the differential equation, you solve it. You can solve it in two different ways. One is to figure out what is x as a function of t. And we physicists, uh, our, bread and butter, our bread and butter is solving differential equations. So uh, I believe that uh, if it get complicated, we know how to handle it either with uh, analytical tools or with approximate methods or, or with computational tools. So we will solve these differential equations and either we will find that what is x as a function of t, that is the time evolution of x, or we can go for solutions where we will look for steady state solution. What will happen to x in a long time limit when the time evolution stops, when dx dt would be zero, what is the solution? What is the value of x in long time? Limit? So the first one we call the time evolution solution. That is when we find x as a function of t. And if we equate dx dt is equal to zero and we solve just the equation and we find out the solution of x at long time limit when there is no time evolution, we call it a steady state solution. So this is the basic mathematics that is, that is behind it. So now if we talk about epidemic models, just as I said, there would be three major populations in the simplest model. Susceptible, that are the uninfected people, infectious who are infected and able to transmit the infection to the susceptible people, and recovered people who have been recovered from the disease. Simplest, simplest way to do it, okay? So we are, for now we are ignoring any latent infection like uh, that happened in COVID that some people have caught the infection, but uh, they are not showing any symptoms, but they can still spread the disease. I'm not talking about that right now, but we'll introduce that kind of a term soon. And uh, there are uh, there are uh, other kind of factors that can we go on uh, adding one by one to make our model more complicated. But in the simplest form, this is our model. So this is the first step to write down a model. You de determine your populations, you determine the boxes, in which you can place the people in a society and you draw arrows in it. And you see that susceptible are becoming infected, infected are becoming recovered. Once you have this, 
Then the next step is to write down differential equations for all the three populations. So here, it's a three-variable model. It's a three-variable model means that S is changing with time, I is also changing with time, and R is also changing with time. All of them are variables. Beta and gamma are not variables. They are parameters of the system. So when you once you uh, solve them, you will have the solution in terms of beta and gamma. So gamma and beta are parameters of the system. S, I, and R are variables of the system. So now we write down the differential equations associated with it uh, as, with some assumptions. As I just said, a very, very naive way of modeling it. Population is fixed, no entries, no births, death, departures, no latency or exposed people who can spread the disease. And the infected people, infective lifetime, a person, the time he, uh, he is in the infective state, the entire time he can spread the disease, okay? And a perfect recovery, that after recovery, people are immune, they cannot get sick again. So these are my assumptions when I write down these differential equations. So what would be these differential equations? These are the differential equations. I want to spend just a couple of minutes to just explain to you how these differential equations are written here. So as I said, how will I write down the differential equations? I will see that how many arrows are going in or coming out of that particular box. So for example, in S, I have just one arrow going out of the box. That means susceptible population can only reduce in the assumptions and in the model that I have right now. Susceptible population can only reduce means I will have a negative term. So the first thing is I put a negative sign. What is the rate at which they will leave? Beta. And what is this beta signifying? The beta is signifying that a susceptible person meets an infected person and the infected person transmits the disease to the susceptible one, right? So the infected person uh, gives the disease, he sneezes or coughs or something like that happens and the disease comes to the susceptible people. So that person who was in susceptible population moves to the infected population. So what are the factors that can control this? The first thing is that how infectious the disease is, right? So that property, the property is related to neither susceptible or infected people, which is a global property of the system, is taken into account by this parameter beta. Beta is taking care of how infectious this disease is. High beta means very infectious, low beta means less infectious. Okay? And it also depends on how many susceptible and infected people are there. Right? So if you have only single infected person, how many person he can meet? Right? And it also depends on how many susceptible people you have. If you have a lot of susceptible people, there is the probability also becomes high that the infected people person will meet a lot of susceptible people. So it is proportional to the number of uninfected people present and how contagious the disease is. Thus, this is the equation. Beta, that is how contagious the disease is. S and I, that is the number of susceptible and infected people normalized by the fraction. So either you consider that total number of susceptible people meeting a fraction of infected people, the total fraction, N is the total uh, population, that is I by N tells you what is the fraction of infected people and that basically tells you that what is the probability of meeting an infected person while you move around into this population, right? So normalized by this N. That is the first equation that I wrote that how the susceptible population decreases. And when this population decreases, these many people per unit time leave the susceptible population and go into the infected box. Right? So this is the term, this is the term that tells you that how the infected population's number is going up. The same number. The people who are living, they're not going anywhere, they're just leaving this box and entering this box. Thus, this is the total population that is entering. Uh, this infective population. Okay. Now, how that, uh, how many arrows are there related to infected population? I see one is going in. That is, I have already taken care of. And another leaving out. This out arrow that I have is from infected to recovered. And the infected to recovered transition depends on how much good healthcare facility I can provide to uh, these people. So, if uh, I have a very good uh, healthcare facility, then I will save more and more of them, they will be recovered very soon. That factor is taken care by this parameter gamma. Gamma takes into account that how fast you can recover, what is the rate of your recovery. This also uh, is uh, a parameter that takes care of the fact that uh, uh, 
what is the standard time in which a person recovers from a virus usually the viruses have a standard time uh, up to which you remain sick so that also is uh, taken care inside this parameter gamma and obviously if you have more infected people per unit time more people will be uh, recovered thus gamma times i so these many people get recovered and they leave infected population and join the recovered population thus drdt becomes gamma i again so this is the total uh, three variable differential equations all coupled differential equations which gives the idea of the simplest simplest kind of a model that can give us an interpretation of how this disease spreads okay and with all these assumptions that i mentioned right so all these assumptions that i mentioned this is the simplest model that explains that how this uh, particular uh, disease can spread so two parameters beta and gamma both would be greater than 0 because both are kind of rates or probabilities and sir are all numbers of people if you consider uh, all of them normalized divide them by n and call fraction of people in all these populations still all of them uh, all the variables are also positive so re all real positive values for parameters as well as my variables so this is the simplest model that i have and if i now solve these differential equations and i try to figure out s as a function of t r as a function of t i as a function of t this is the graph that i get and in in all our uh, uh, data that we were seeing for covid and we not talk about this first wave second wave and we are looking at this data and always we see this bell shaped curves right this is the bell shape that we see here this is the graph the infectious disease infectious fraction of infectious people in a in a population or maybe uh, total number of infected people in a population that gives me this bell shaped curve susceptible constantly goes down recovered constantly goes up and this is the bell this is the wave that we mentioned right so in one set of differential equations if we go on solving it you get this one wave that uh, gives you an idea of how uh, the disease has spread and uh, if you change the parameters what can happen the curve this peak can be very sharp or this peak can be very flat this rise can be very sharp or very flat and these factors put direct pressure on the infrastructure that you have so suppose i have that this this total time gives you that how, how what is the total time we are spending with this pandemic right so this this axis the time axis tells you the lifetime of the pandemic this height tells you that the in, in a certain time instant how many people were sick at the same time because you have to provide health in health, health uh, infrastructure to all of them so the height of the peak matters if you can make this curve a little bit flat then people get sick but at at a much more slower rate and you can provide you know, infrastructure to them as they get recovered at the same time right but if this is a very sharp peak then it always happens that uh, at a certain point in time at a certain period of time there will be huge pressure on your health infrastructure and we have seen it so uh, we understand that what happens uh, in this kind of a situation so the simplest model using uh, uh, just three variables and two parameters is ir okay so uh, beta and gamma uh, are the parameters associated with it and if i if i take the ratio of these two parameters and we find out beta by gamma that quantity is a very important quantity and uh, in in all of epidemiology this particular quantity is a very important quantity which tells you that how uh, powerful an epidemic is going to be Uh, this ratio is called the basic reproduction number and this basically means that uh, as the term as the name suggests that how many infected person a single infected person can create right so suppose a person is sick for 10 days how many people he can infect in those 10 days okay that is called on average on average in the total population how many per, per people he infects in those 10 days okay so beta is the rate at which he infects and one by gamma is the rate at which he recovers so beta by gamma gives you a, 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 a kind of an estimate that how far this disease will spread and this is a very important quantity an epidemic always occurs if beta by gamma is greater than 1 mathematically and uh, if you get higher and higher values of this reproduction number that means you are going to face a very very strong pandemic so 
there are alternative frameworks as well uh, and that applies to different kind of diseases for example if there is a disease where uh, getting recovered does not make sure that you get immune uh, on the other hand you can get sick once again right uh, right uh, respiratory viral infections influenza kind of things right so there you catch the infection you you get recovered but then you can get sick again so then there is no point of adding another population of recovered but you can just consider that switching between susceptible and infected and write down your model in the same way i did uh, write down your differential equations this time you will have just two variables but the two parameters should also be there with a similar constants right so this is an alternative framework depending on what kind of disease you have so this way you can adapt a model to your framework as your uh, disease has changed and as you want to add more and more realistic features realistic things into your model for example sirs when you recover you stay there recover for some time then you join the uh, susceptible population once again so maybe loss of immunity after 6 months after 6 months you can get susceptible once again some diseases are there where people uh, usually recover fast but they can also go into a chronic state where they remain sick for a very very long time these two time scales are different you can get either recovered very fast or you move on to a chronic state and, and you stay there for very long time so you draw your compartments accordingly this is these are called compartmental models of society you draw compartments accordingly you write down your parameters and then you start writing down your differential equations counting your arrows how many arrows going out how many arrows coming in which term is basically needs presence of another person like infected person presence of infected person is needed for getting from susceptible to infected or it is a linear phenomenon so linear or non linear you just judge it and you write down your differential equations so you can go on complicating these models depending on the demand of the player particular disease that you are dealing with and kind of this is the model that uh, is well accepted right now uh, 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 for covid-19 and people are trying to uh, model phenomena variants of this model but this is this is the kind of model that we have so what how many populations we have five populations we have susceptible exposed infected quarantined recovered susceptible are the same people who can get infected exposed that means you have caught the infection but you have not shown any symptoms so you are still undetected and you are still spreading the disease so that means from susceptible to exposed you can move in two different ways the first way if you can meet an exposed person second way if you can meet if you meet an infected person so two arrows i have placed two ways you can move from susceptible to exposed exposed is when you caught the disease but not showing any symptoms but after a certain time with some probability will show symptoms and you move from exposed to infected population infected is showing symptoms uh, subject to testing if if it is tested if you are aware enough that you go for testing uh, you will be asked to get quarantined once you are quarantined you are not meeting ideally speaking you are not meeting anyone and you are restricted from being spreading the disease anymore so you remain quarantined and it takes some time for you to getting recovered to the recovered state and some people are uh, maybe not tested they remain uh, in the uh, infective sp- uh, state and then finally they recover after a certain amount of time so these are the arrow pictures so i think uh, the idea of the model and the arrows are more or less clear now you put one by one parameters to all these arrows and you count on yourself that how how many uh, 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 parameters you have and how complicated the system is going to be okay so these are the this is the more or less the modified uh, framework from sir model that is being adapted to understand uh, the dynamics of uh, covid-19 pandemic so uh, with this setup five differential equations all coupled you can now go on and solve these differential equations now uh, to get the time solution uh, you need to solve all the coupled set of differential equation and figure out s of s as a function of t e as a function of t and so on that is not possible uh, analytically doing it not possible take help of computational tools you solve the differential equation using your computational tools and you vary the parameters to see that what parameters are affecting the spread of the disease much much okay so that is the that is the question that is the first question that was the first goal of developing a model which of these parameters so many of them 
which of parameters are actually most important in controlling the disease because if you think you can associate one or other physical quantity to each of these parameters right for example e to i what is the fraction what is the what should this parameter reflect it must reflect the testing efficiency right that uh, how how a person from exposed people person goes to infective state or how an infected person goes to recovery state how a current how what is the rate of getting quarantine you can associate one or other parameter with every uh, one uh, physical uh, factor with every parameter that is lying there right so you change them and you see their effect on on your uh, uh, epidemic uh, model right so uh, how do you control it you get a hint of that from there so there are several ways of controlling the it so the first way would be reducing the susceptible population itself that particular way of controlling it is vaccination so if you vaccinate the number of people in the susceptible state are going to reduce uh, uh, as soon as they take vaccine right that is what is supposed to happen so you can draw an arrow directly from susceptible to recovered or you can consider them people who have immunity right so you can draw an arrow directly from susceptible to recovered and uh, uh, relate a parameter of the efficiency of vaccination along with that reducing beta or epsilon so let me just go and show you beta and epsilon were these two parameters who indicated that how will you move from susceptible to exposed what are the phenomena what are the interventions that we are doing to stop that these are the things like washing hands isolating sick people that means stopping you to meet with exposed and infected people that basically is reflected by beta and epsilon so if you are stopping the infected people or exposed people meeting with you those parameters are reflected by beta and epsilon when you to, uh, close down shut down public events things like that that is what you do or improve uh, increasing the a better uh, efficient faster efficient testing kits and you move people from infected to quarantine so this this could be various ways and you can suggest your own ways by uh, creating a model and studying that how it works how it functions and how it can be uh, affecting the actual infection scenario okay so uh, that this, this is the vaccination uh, thing that is happening right now so you can add an arrow like this you can draw uh, draw another box for vaccinated people and you can add it directly here or if, if you consider vaccinated and recovered people as same you can just directly add an arrow like this to the recovered population and you have to write down that term in your uh, set of differential equations to account for it okay so this is how you include phenomena of vaccination into it so uh, this is this is the basic way of how uh, you model it with with uh, ordinary differential equations but ordinary differential equations are just one approach of modeling this this systems and uh, one of the major things that is left out in this particular way though it's very efficient and very successfully predicting and very successfully trying to estimate uh, the possible intervention strategies there are some questions that are un unanswered in this kind of models and those questions are like here we answer question like how many people will be infected at a time, current uh, at, at a particular point in time how many of them will remain infected how many uh, how fast or how slow the disease will die out this kind of global general questions we can answer but uh, we cannot answer questions like uh, who is like to be likely to be uh, infected next or which are the critical person who are uh, whom we should vaccinate who are who are the critical pers persons for infection spreading whom we should uh, vaccinate first right so no individual it's a global uh, phenomena global questions are being answered by this ode approach but if you want to answer more individual level phenomena like who and which kind of questions then we should go for other modeling techniques and that mostly relies on uh, tools which are uh, on, uh, where we relax these assumptions and making the system a, a little bit more stochastic where noise probability things like that comes into the picture okay neighborhood information these things come to the picture 
and because that makes us different from each other, right? That where I am staying, where you are, which are the people that you meet every day, which are the people that I meet every day, how many people do you meet every day, and how many people I meet every day, that makes you and me different in terms of epidemic spreading, and that will tell tell us that who is the more vulnerable or who is uh, uh, working more to spread the disease, right? So instead of this homogeneous mixing where we assume that everyone can meet everyone and we uh, ignore the heterogeneity present in the society, uh, we consider neighborhood information using the simplest kind of models which are lattice models. So lattice models are basically tool of physics and lattice gas models, uh, lattice Brownian motion models, uh, lattice spin models like where you consider that up, up and down spins present and they are flipping uh, depending on and these are well known to students of physics that how uh, spins flip, how they um, go towards one one particular uh, kind of steady state and how we take into neighborhood of information uh, to account for the phenomena of this flipping, right? That if you have a spin surrounded by uh, many, uh, an up spin surrounded by many down spins, then there, the probability of that particular spin getting flipped gets more, uh, is much more. So this is a neighborhood information and we can use this kind of tools to understand epidemic spreading on lattice. So let me just show you how you can do that. So you can consider a 2D community, you can consider a community of a 2D lattice system, okay? where you consider some boxes are getting filled by this blue color and some boxes are empty. So this is a huge box and if you zoom into it, you will see this uh, small pixels, blue and black pixels. So you can consider that whenever you, a box is filled with blue, there you can assume that there is a house or there are some person and, and other places are empty. Okay? And uh, then you can sprinkle some uh, information about who is sick in this population and you can uh, use the same techniques like spin flip finding probability of who is more probable of getting sick in the next step. Uh, using the neighborhood information. You can consider different ranges of neighborhood and that will give you uh, also an estimation of how much the people are moving. So if there is lockdown, then you can consider that uh, the people in a particular house like this are not going to be much away from their own house and you can consider a neighborhood of just D is equal to 1. So here I just uh, denote that how we are considering the neighborhood in this simulation. So if they are not moving that much, then they may be considering D is equal to 1. Okay. And uh, if it is a bit relaxed, then maybe D equal to 2. When there is no lockdown or a sudden uh, lifting of lockdown, you can consider that they move uh, a large radius around them. And uh, if they can move there, then they can also infect people. There. So uh, what we have done is that we have taken satellite images, which is available uh, using uh, Google Earth. You can take these satellite images of localities. And using some simple basic image processing techniques, you can convert this uh, satellite images into a 2D lattice. You can one by one go on, uh, do some simple image processing uh, like contrast adjustment and also uh, thresholding and you can get a picture like this. Okay, when some boxes are filled and some boxes are empty. Then you take these tiles and over the entire pop picture of a town, of a, of a state, you can create a big lattice where each and every small locality is basically something like this. Okay? So I think you understand what I'm saying here. So you can take the satellite picture and you can basically map it onto your lattice and you can now take the information that, and that information is basically available uh, in, in uh, your uh, online COVID-19 websites which are tracking data every day, that which town or which cities or which localities, which pin codes to be very specifically uh, you see COVID infection, you start from there, you make one of these boxes red, and you start seeing the evolution, time evolution of how this disease can spread. So you see that starting uh, sprinkling this disease in one or two boxes over the entire population, as time goes on, you can track one by one how the disease is spreading. And here you can answer this individual question that which locality, which town, which people, are more probable of getting sick in the next time step. Okay, you can change the density of these lattice boxes and assume societies with less and a very high population density and see different results there. 
you can assume different rate of transitions, different probabilities of how people can uh, get sick, and you can basically extract that from real data that you have online available. So uh, these are the simulations that you can perform, and they, that gives very, very uh, accurate uh, behavior of how uh, a particular uh, system behaves uh, in long time limit and what you can expect uh, from the system in long time limit. So here I had a video, but I don't know why it's still loading. Okay, so let me just skip that. So here I had a video to see, uh, show you the difference between uh, the epidemic spread, uh, simulated epidemic spread in a dense populated area uh, and a scattered populated area. And uh, that tells you basically the difference, uh, the measures that we need to take, separate measures that we need to take for areas where the population is really dense and how that might affect the disease spread. Uh, what is the extent of the disease spread that also so here it, it, it has started so you can see the dense populated area is being uh, it is so fast infection is spreading there and uh, at the end almost everyone is infected in there okay on the other hand in scattered population a huge chunk is still left where the, where the disease can spread so the intervention policy could not be same for both these uh, areas that we have here here you can see uh, the effect of uh, neighborhood that is the um, if people obey lockdown kind of things very well and if they do not then how the um, how it affects how it affects the disease trans, trans, uh, transmission so in the first picture here in the first uh, simulation here you see where uh, d is one that is the first nearest neighbor uh, range is only being considered for uh, for uh, the disease transmission in the other one here you consider up to the second uh, level of uh, neighbors and uh, the disease transmission uh, range is is abruptly different in both uh, these scenarios the simulation is again taking some time to run but uh, uh, that that can be seen from these simulations that in d is equal to one uh, the number of infection uh, where people are obeying lockdown the number of infection and the uh, number of people getting sick at each and every time step are much more different than when people are not obeying and you can basically uh, relate it to real data and see uh, what kind of uh, behavior you can expect. So just d is equal to 1 to d is equal to 2. That is the difference that you can see. Okay, So just one, a little bit one step away from your neighborhood and this is the difference uh, that, that you see. Okay, So uh, uh, let us uh, come to vaccination in lattice models. So if you want to consider vaccination in lattice models, what, what you are going to do is you are going to uh, add, uh, you will select some people in this lattice model and call them, immunize them. That means you will vaccinate them and they cannot get sick anymore. They cannot uh, spread the disease anymore. Okay? So here in a, in a lattice, you add some, some people who are infected, these red blobs, and some people who are vaccinated, the blue blobs. And then you study the lattice. Uh, the, dynamics onto the lattice. So using this uh, model, the other ways to use a similar kind of model are networks. So in networks, the restriction that one person can only have 2D picture, something like that is basically removed. And you can consider that uh, different people in a population can have different uh, levels of uh, friends, different, uh, different levels of people they meet. These lines basically indicate friendships or people you meet every day in people in your neighborhood, things like that. And if you draw this kind of, create this kind of a picture over a network uh, in your society, then you will see that there are always some people who are uh, meeting a lot of people every day, who meet a lot of people. They have a lot of friends either or their job is such that they meet a lot of people every day, while some people are there who just meet one or two people. Okay? So uh, similar studies as I have seen, in, I have shown it in, in, in uh, lattice models, can be adapted and implemented in case of uh, networks as well. Similar studies can be done. Here also, these individual questions can be asked that which people you should choose for uh, vaccination, which who should get priority. Uh, and you can add attributes like age, attributes like uh, vulnerability, comorbidity, 
as the node attributes node properties these balls are called nodes you can add them as node properties and also manipulate that that if someone's age is high uh, there is a high possibility that he or she will get sick or something like that okay so this is uh, another way of uh, just extension of the lattice model i would say uh, in in uh, form of networks okay now the results of this network and lattice models could be extremely uh, powerful in predicting uh, real data so the data that i am showing here showing uh, to you here is basically the first wave prediction that we did and uh, for uh, for uh, around 40 countries we did this prediction and uh, with a very high accuracy where the where the curve was still rising in exponential phase we predicted that how it will fall when it will fall and it was doing it was showing extremely good performance uh, in using simple lattice model the theory of physics that we have learned right so this is kind of uh, the total uh, a snapshot of some results that we had starting from uh, countries which and we took input from from uh, the online data of what is how sparsely or how uh, congested this city, this uh, places are what is the population density what is the total population of these countries and we uh, fit our data our model to it with extremely uh, good uh, fitting and extremely high uh, accuracy of range now these are the data for first waves and up to this everything was running quite fine our models are working quite fine but the question nowadays we are asking ourselves is what caused the second wave right and uh, i will just take five more minutes five uh, more minutes to explain uh, the fact the behavioral factors that are associated with it now to answer in one line what caused the second wave is that we as human beings are not always rational and we don't uh, we are not always cooperative uh, as well okay so we always take, we several times we take these decisions uh, in form of games we call them games in mathematics and we take these decisions risky decisions uh which are not always very rational which are not always expected uh, that we, we will take okay and uh, uh, this behavioral factors when you take into account with these models can give rise to beautiful phenomena which can basically make you understand that why these things happen which were still uh, preventable so the the dynamics that we are seeing right now is basically a game of self interest versus social interest so there is a concept in game theory which tells you that uh, there is always a cost right associated either with vaccine or either with uh, obeying lockdown if you obey lockdown you cannot move you cannot open your shops right if you remain voluntarily uh, self quarantine if you uh, uh, there are always some costs associated with it. and there is always a cost associated with the fact that if you get sick then what will happen there is a huge cost for your treatment and you might also die but several times it happens that we don't consider we don't weigh these two possibilities in a very right way okay so this social outcome that we expect in total global phenomena is the overall vaccination coverage or overall what is happening over the society but we don't always calculate that most of the time we calculate that what will happen if i take the vaccine or if i do not take the vaccine how much i I am going to get affected. What will happen if I obey the lockdown? If I don't open open my shop? If I don't travel long distances? How much I am getting benefited, or how much loss I am facing? So this is basically a game of uh, self interest and social interest, and we are taking these decisions all every time in our life. We don't really understand that how it is happening. Uh, we just we do it, but we don't really understand the underlying uh, uh, dynamics of it. so uh, to be very precise that uh, uh, if i want to map it in a form of a matrix then suppose there are two strategies related to vaccine that i can uh, take let us consider it's a vaccination game with a perfect vaccine perfect vaccine means that if you take the vaccine you will not get infected 100% sure that you are not getting infected okay i'm not talking about any side effects but you are not getting infected of it so let us consider a vaccination game with a perfect vaccine where there are two strategies that you can take you can either get vaccinated or you can not get vaccinated okay now if you get the vaccine and you remain healthy okay then you pay the 
cost of the vaccine. So let us consider that the cost of the vaccine is CR and that goes out of your pocket. So you are at a cost of minus CR. You pay the vaccine, vaccine fees and you uh, remain healthy. Okay? And if you do not take the vaccine and you get infected, then say you are paying an, uh, an amount of 1. So okay, I'm just, I have just normalized it. You can consider it to be any value. Okay? So this is the value that you pay if you get infected, if you have to pay the hospital charges or whatever the other charges that are associated with the infection. But if you do not take the vaccine and you remain healthy, then you are at zero. So both the costs are minus 1, minus CR. But if you are not vaccinated and you remain healthy, you are at zero and you are at the maximum benefit. Right? So if you are not vaccinated and still healthy, that is the maximum payoff you can get out of this game. That is the maximum benefit that you can take out of this game. And this is one of the major reasons that people have developed this vaccine hesitancy. People have a fear about the uh, uh, side effects and other things about the vaccine. And they also consider the fact that, okay, I was healthy till now, then why, why should I take the vaccine, right? What, why should I take the vaccine? I, I would remain healthy and I can save on both sides. So this is basically called a vaccination game and don't consider this cost to be just a monetary cost. These can be associated with other benefits as well. So these are the costs that you, that you pay overall. Okay, And if you remain healthy and not vaccinated, you are at the maximum benefit. So this is basically a game that is going on uh, along with the second wave when it started. Uh, uh, along uh, Before the second wave, actually, vaccines were available in India from January 16th. And uh, second wave started at around March. And the rate of vaccine, if you see, the rate of vaccination was drastically different before and after the second wave started. And what is the reason for it? The reason is basically this self-interest that we have. So if you want to study this dynamics, what you can do is that you can take a network of the society. You can one way do the epidemic spreading. And the other side, you can consider the vaccination decision making. The decision making switches like spins, up spin and down spin. Here, VH means vaccine hesitant, who does not want to take vaccine. VR is vaccine ready, who are willing to take vaccine. And people continuously switch between these two states and they always judge that which will give them the maximum payoff. If you study this dynamics coupled in, 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 in a, a network along with the epidemic spreading, that can basically give rise to the second wave and show you that how uh, this hesitancy of people, the decision making, the game, can give rise uh, to uh, this phenomena like uh, second wave and other, other interesting phenomena as well. So, uh, for, for this purpose of studying vaccine hesitancy and its evolution with time, uh, we are conducting a survey. I think I have asked the organizers also to uh, uh, send these survey links to all the, uh, all the uh, participants. I still request you all to, uh, if you have not filled this, this up, please try help us to uh, gather more data. Uh, so this is the coverage of uh, all around India that we have right now and we are studying in terms of location, in terms of uh, disease picture at each and every place uh, depending on uh, the hesitancy that we have people or had people. So some people are vaccinated right now but they had some uh, strong hesitancy uh, 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 until a few months back. Right. So um, what was the reason of that and if you can uh, we can uh, study that. Uh, that would be a really uh, great thing uh, for us to understand that how people uh, take their decisions and how that is coupled with the disease dynamics. So I uh, urge you all to fill this up, uh, fill up this survey, and help us to gather more data. We have already collected around uh, thousand data, so more will help us more. So you can dig deeper on these topics. Uh, we can under we can just consider various phenomena like. Uh, avoidance and new friendships forming due to due to this uh, pandemic situation. You can start avoiding people who are sick. You can get associated with new people. You will have a lattice structure which is continuously evolving or a network structure which is continuously uh, evolving. There could be rigid people who will not take vaccine or will, which, who are against social distancing, people like that. You can add these individual properties to them. You can study competition with the delay, so you can start and assume that the disease has already started and then at a point vaccines arrive, what happens then? And obviously you can study vaccine hesitancy and the behavioral reasons. There are many more things to extend these problems and make them more and more closer uh, to the reality. So 
uh, this is uh, another way but uh, today i don't have much time to talk about it this is brownian motion based tracking of disease and here you can basically study the spatial fomites that i mentioned that someone leaves the place but still leaves uh, a, a track of viruses behind and if someone crosses that there is a certain probability that he or she can get sick it's another way of understanding uh, or spatially uh, how the disease could um, uh, affect in, in spatial uh, way if, if the disease is spreading not only from people to people but also through uh, uh, the space so uh, just as a finishing note i want to say that uh, these tools are powerful they are extremely powerful because uh, now i am we are feeling a uh, we are facing a pandemic and we are modeling and understanding and predicting its data and uh, what else can spread other than a virus several things actually spread like a virus like an idea or a habit or some scientific theory rumors spread rumors spread very very fast through these social networks nowadays using whatsapp and facebook these things face we have uh, uh, spread very fast and the dynamics is exactly like the same you can consider that some person who knows about the rumor and he spreads uh, that to someone else and those who do not know it they are the susceptible people and that is how it spreads political campaign spread trends spread so using similar mechanism similar methodologies adapting it to the proper problem that you are doing you have to change it a little bit according to the problem that you are handling you can also study this social epidemics or social contagion so that the power of this particular tools do not end with epidemic it is much beyond that understanding social phenomena so to conclude the take home messages i would uh, uh, want to convey to you is that we learned how differential equations could be a good tool to understand model of epidemics they are very simple models simplest models uh, with uh, with very computationally light platform many a times uh, handle uh, you can handle them analytically if not then uh, small uh, computational tools are enough to solve these differential equations relaxing assumptions a little bit lattice models uh, tools borrowed from physics can be used extensively and very much uh, in a real life picture uh, to understand uh, this disease spread and also we discussed a little bit about vaccine perception and underlying this game uh, of vaccine perception a little bit uh, and we also i just tried to expose you a little bit about the versatility of the tools and the huge spectrum of the scopes that are there so if uh, some students are interested to read further read on these topics these are some very good books and some further references if these are good starting points to the beautiful world of dynamical systems where your knowledge of theoretical physics would be extremely handy to handle problems which are real life problems so i uh, uh, stop here for today uh, again urging you once again to survey uh, to answer you uh, through our survey link uh, i will welcome all the questions now thank you Thank you, uh, Dr. Shankar Ghosh. It was a wonderful presentation. Uh, hello. Uh, so I would request uh, our colleague, uh, Professor Shivnath Kuchai, to hold the question answer session. Uh, Shivnath. Uh, hello. Yes, I am on mute. Hmm hmm hmm. Yes, yes, you are on. Last question. Urmila Sengupta, why is there negative sign in gamma? Uh, can you just repeat the question once again? Ask question. Urmila Sengupta, why is there negative sign in gamma? Ah, uh, negative sign in gamma. Okay. So uh, the infected population can increase if susceptibles get sick, but it can decrease if the susceptibles recover. So. in for increasing terms we add the positive signs for decreasing terms we add negative signs and that's why we have this negative sign gamma in front of that will be a negative sign in the infection equation because that is how the population reduces and a positive sign in the recovered equation because that is how the recovered population increases okay so signs should be decided depending on the way of the arrows if the arrows are going in a box positive out a box negative okay second question sun sanjay day Why we did not divide by n in case of gamma proportionality or second term in the rate of change of sick people? Uh, I I am not uh, actually getting the question very clearly. Is it written in the chat? I can take it yes, from yes, here. Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, just let me just uh, have a look from there. 
uh, okay so shonjay de right so why do i write uh, by n in case of gamma proportionality or the second term in the rate of change of sick people okay okay so nice question here is that that in the first first equation if you see that how many so say uh, there are some infective people in a population right and you are a susceptible person you are one susceptible person so what is the probability that if you met 10 people in a day one of them is infected what is the probability of that you take the total number of infected people and the divided by the total population that gives you the probability that out of the 10 people how many of them would be sick right so there the division by n was necessary but in case of gamma what we are finding is that at a particular rate per unit time say in 10 days the covid patients generally recover then gamma would be 1 by 10 okay and the multiplicative factor is i because if there are already five people sick then out of those five people some would get recovered after 10 days so there there is no need of uh, the 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 total absolute number is necessary where we do not need a fraction of the total population right so we need to know that if i have 100 sick people and they are supposed to get uh, recovered in 10 days then how many of them are recovered in per unit time so there i do not need to divide the total population by n right so that is that is the answer so uh, the next question is by uh, anjan chandra when can we say it is an epidemic so uh, mathematically speaking if r0 is more than 1 this is an epidemic okay and uh, uh, if we want to understand this conceptually then the total number of sick people in a population should become zero then you say if the epidemic is over once the epidemic starts and it goes through this exponential phase always the epidemic when they start and if r0 that is the beta by gamma term is more than 1 It will always start through this exponential growth. If the, it has this exponential growth, it is going to be an epidemic. When the epidemic uh, is over, when it falls, and the total population becomes zero, then you can say the epidemic is over. But in a population like us, where you have big country, then uh, it is not possible to uh, assume that it is zero. But maybe below a certain threshold, you can say that the epidemic is uh, over. Okay. So the next question is by Palash Nath. Uh, how the unit time unit of time is chosen in numerical calculation for for the numerical simulation the time first is adjusted as iterations so in each iteration we calculate then we pan it over any uh, any particular uh, country's data that we are simulating and we scale it accordingly that is how we choose the time axis for uh, numerical simulation so first it is just iterations step 1 step 2 step 3 like that and then we pan it over the entire for a particular country the time that we are taking we take that map it over uh, each uh, it it and then we take it as gains we calculate it as gains according okay. uh what is the significance of omega in the accepted model i i do not understand this question which which model do you mean population where people can join people can leave so there is a birth rate and the death rate death rate is fixed for susceptible people exposed people but it is a little bit more for infected people and that is basically because of uh, the uh, disease so they have the infection so their death rate has to be a little bit more right so that is that is the significance of omega uh, then uh, rahul gupta has asked how we able to show a differential equation of people who goes infected and after a particular time they die or does uh, i i do not uh, this question is not that clear so i i am not very clear about this question 
I'm skipping it. So, Shravani Chakravarti asked that is this a complete information game? There is always possibility of multiple equilibria. In particular, uh, in coordination game, uh, there is always a trivial equilibrium when no one vaccinates. Yes, that is always true. There is always a trivial equilibrium when no one vaccinates. We uh, must uh, consider that system, but that is not a very realistic scenario in, in a in a society where you have this real population where noise is present. So that is not very much expected. That that uh, there is always uh, in, in the epidemic also there is always an equilibrium where everyone uh, remains uh, susceptible and no one gets infected. So, but that never happens depending on the value of beta and gamma. It always starts. So similar way you can consider it to be uh, that that trivial equilibrium is not something that uh, is going to happen. And you can also consider basically peer influence in these games. You can consider that if you're, and that is basically happening in our society as well. I have seen in my own family that uh, my mother was very much uh, skeptic about vaccination, but as soon as my aunt took the vaccine and she was well, uh, she, uh, my mother considered taking the vaccine and she was suddenly convinced. So this peer effect is also there. So we can consider that as well. Um, uh, all models are on by uh, macroscopically counted, why don't we take it microscopically as genes, immunity, etc. in course. Uh, this is population models we are talking about. We are not, not talking about uh, in, in genes, immunity and biological levels. So uh, this is, these are population models where we are considered the, um, trying to model the society. Okay? So uh, how this model could explain uh, succeeding waves in a pandemic, I think I answered that question. Uh, and can we use these models uh, on, uh, these are epidemic model, we can use them, them to model any pandemic data and uh, we can model it. Uh, can the model be mapped on nonlinear dynamics? Uh, this is nonlinear dynamics basically because uh, the equations that we write down are uh, basically nonlinear in nature. They are first order differential equations and when you study coupled systems which have nonlinear terms in it, uh, you, you uh, get uh, nonlinear interaction between them and the tools that we use are basically from nonlinear tools. Uh, Sumit Mukherjee said, are these calculations applicable for all, all class of population? Uh, I, I don't understand this question, so if uh, he clarifies it a little bit, it would be better. Okay, Shongita, I think uh, if there are any, uh, any further questions, I can take that. Oh, uh, Koushik Pal is uh, there. Uh, hello, uh, Koushik Pal, can you hear us? Hello. Oh, okay, okay. So, yes, 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 yes. I, have, I have received the answer. I have received the answer. Uh, and uh, Shumit Mukherjee clarified, uh, yes, uh, this could be, uh, in that sense, yes, this could be ma mapped in uh, every kind of uh, places because, uh, but you have to consider that uh, in all, uh, like village population and urban population, uh, population density is different, people's awareness levels are different, hesitancy uh, is different. So, uh, if you need to con consider those things and you can uh, do, uh, place your model accordingly. আমার একটা কোশ্চেন ছিল ওই হ্যাঁ ফার্স্ট একদম প্রথমে যে মডেলটা নিয়ে খুব সিম্পল একটা মডেল দিয়ে ডিসকাস করা হচ্ছিল তখন একটা ওই ইনফেক্টেড পিপলের একটা গ্রাফ দেখলাম আমরা যেটা স্কেল শেপড গ্রাফ ছিল সেখানে টাইমের স্কেলটা বা এগুলো কিভাবে চুজ করা হচ্ছিল ওই ইন্টারেকশন থেকে এখানে যেটা যেটা মানে দা graph that I have shown you is just solution of the differential equations. Even Shekhane time scale is basically being uh, decided by uh, this beta and gamma. Mane, gamma is basically the recovery rate. Mane, uh, consider that uh, people uh, recover in a, in a certain amount of time. right? So suppose gamma is 0.1, that basically means that people are supposed to get recovered after 10 days, 1 by 10, something like that. Okay? Shekhane take a time scale is coming into the picture. 
but uh, the, the graphs that I have shown you just are the solutions of the differential equation only. A simulation result now. These are just uh, direct uh, solution of the differential equation, proper differential equation, solved it and figured out the functions. पपुलेशन डेंसिटी এবং নাম কিছু কিছু ডেটা উই উই ক্যান গেট ফ্রম যে যে ডেটা উই হ্যাভ অন মাই অনলাইন যে ওয়ার্ল্ডোমিটার বল বা এনি আদার ওয়েবসাইটস दट আর হোস্টিং কোভিড-19 ডেটা ফ্রম देयर ইউ ক্যান বেসিক্যালি গেট দিস আইডিয়া अबाउट ইনিশিয়াল ইনফেকশন কত ছিল হোয়াট ইজ দা এভারেজ পপুলেশন অফ দিস কান্ট্রি হোয়াট ইজ দা এভারেজ এজ অফ পিপল ইন দা কান্ট্রি দিস ইউ ক্যান গেট এন্ড দা প্যারামিটার্স আর বেসিক্যালি অপটিমাইজড ইউ অপটিমাইজ ইউজিং জেনেটিক অ্যালগরিদম জেনেটিক অ্যালগরিদম একটা মানে uh optimization algorithm data we have used uh, to figure out je jodi ei rokom data hoy tale parameter gulo ki hobe parameter gulo shob prothom theke fix chilo so parameter gulor modhe kichu kichu like the population size uh, the population density and maybe the age je gulo ekta kono country er jonno jante para jay jemon for for, hmm. for example india er jonno amader average age hocche around 25 On the other hand, US is getting such a huge forty. So, even for the data, you can get from country-specific data. Our Baki data, Baki pure model parameter has been optimized using genetic algorithm, fitting it. Okay. Our is a computational, je ita use kora hoy solve kora jo no shita kiro kum type er mane kono programming method ba mane ki tool use kora hoy shita. Any programming ta Python e kora hoyche. Lattice ta ke pasti consider kore Python platform e it has been done. छोटे among genetic algorithm tries to mix and match parameter values and see that what is the optimum set of parameter values so it again uh, python is basically a borrow matrix niye jekhane the country ta ke puro is represented by ekta borrow mane what should i say ekta matrix si jeta modhe actually puro country ta data ta royeche how many people are there what is the structure kemon bhabe population scattered royeche then you simulate it run the disease এবং তারপরে সেখান থেকে ইউ টেক দা ডেটা এন্ড ট্রাই টু ফিট ইট ইটারেটিভ ভাবে বারবার করে আচ্ছা এটা কারণ মানে যে কোনো ইনফেকশাস ডিজিজের জন্য এই ব্যাপারটা ডাইনামিক থাকে কিন্তু ইভাবে চুজ দা মডেল মানে কারেক্ট ফর টু রিকম হয় যখন আমরা এখন এটা জানা যাচ্ছে যখন আমরা করেছি তখন এটা ছিল না তখন পর্যন্ত ইনফরমেশন ছিল দিস ডেটা দ্যাট আই হ্যাভ টু দা রেজাল্টস দ্যাট আই হ্যাভ শোন ইউ সেটা হচ্ছে ফর লাস্ট ইয়ার अराउंड सेप्टेम्बर एक होला এখন যে কাজ করা আমরা করছি তাতে উই हैव टू कंसीडर দা ফ্যাক্ট दैट सम रिकवर्ड पीपल आर अगेन गेटिंग इन्फेक्टेड So we have to add that error. So if you have to, I mean, choose your model properly. Je to je thora na infection ba je thora na disease we are studying. Accordingly, you have to uh, make your model more and more close to reality. Otherwise, uh, tool gulo shab same. Tool gulo you can use. No problem. But oh, je parameter ta chilo je tar opore value je tar opore depend kore epidemic ka fix kora hot chilo. ठीक है, 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 ठीक
সুতরাং এরকম নয় যে জাস্ট আমি প্যারামিটার গুলোর একটা ডিস্ট্রিবিউশন কনসিডার করে স্টোক্যাস্টিক মডেলে শিফট করে গেছি সেটা কিন্তু নয় মানে আমি পুরো ফ্রেমওয়ার্কটাই অ্যাকচুয়ালি আলাদা হয়ে গেছে আমি বুঝতে পারছি না এক্স্যাক্টলি হয়তো ওনার সাথে একটু ডিসকাস করলে ভালো হতো কিন্তু কোশ্চেনটা হয়তো অ্যানসার করছে কিনা আমি বুঝতে পারছি না অ্যাকচুয়ালি कौशिक
talk was very much uh, her talk gave so many uh, understanding and knowledge on complex dynamics of covid-19 pandemics uh, we can understand now that covid-19 pandemic and such very many other things can be modeled with differential equation uh, she showed us the interesting graphs so we can understand how the first wave second wave third wave can be predicted uh, we also thank her for giving the idea of uh, vaccination game it was very interesting uh, vaccination hesitancy which may make the second wave i thank her for everything uh, thank you shantanu thank you very much for your wonderful talk and now i want to thank our respected principal sir for encouraging and allowing us to organize this webinar i wa also want to thank our iqc coordinator shinjini basu for her kind presence and a uh, special thanks to dr shubhankar shaha department of mathematics for his technical help and support i also want to thank mr debashish bormon professor debashish bormon hod computer science for his kind help i thank my colleague professor shibnath gushai for his constant help and a special thank to dr shongita deshorta our hod who has worked very hard for the past past few days to make this webinar successful last but not the least my deep sense of thanks and appreciation to all the participants who were live with us and attended this webinar with great enthusiasm and made today's event a success so we move to an end of today's seminar thank you once again thank you everyone তাহলে আমরা কি লিভ করব আচ্ছা আমি